There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast, and I'm very excited to be joined in my studio here in Tampa, Florida today with my good friend and business owner, Hunter Williams. Hunter, what's up, my brother? What's up, dude? Good to be in the real studio, not the virtual studio. <laughs> so this is actually only my second live. Well, I shouldn't say that. I've had four, but my in my own studio, this is the second live podcast I've ever done with um, a person. And the first guy was Evan McDermott. And that was back actually in 2021. He came through from where he was living in Minnesota. He came down to Southern California and he stopped. And we spent a couple of days together, which was really cool. And we had a really awesome spiritual podcast. And today's is going to be just the same. But for you guys that don't know Hunter, most of you guys do know Hunter um, because him and I have been working together now for literally about two years. And, you know, he's been in my circle and somewhat following me for like five. And so I've been kind of, you know, really personally mentoring him. So it's, today is going to be an awesome show. But his background is he is a former Division I uh, scholarship athlete at Wake Forest University. He was a starting uh, free safety and also a linebacker. And it was actually all ACC, almost made the NFL. He had a cup of coffee, so to speak. Uh, but thankfully, he didn't because, as he knows, he was suffering from <laughs> massive, uh, you know, CTEs and all sorts of, like, traumatic brain injuries from hitting people all the time. And, you know, we could even talk about that on this podcast and how bad it is in the NFL with guys who are in their 40s and 50s, bro, with their heads and how much pain they're suffering from and stuff like that. But anyway, he's, again, an entrepreneur, a super creator. Uh, he's basically becoming his own influencer now. And he is also the founder of uh, Amazing uh, instant oatmeal company called Zero Oats. And we'll throw a plug at the end of this uh, podcast with a link to you guys to purchase. You can buy it on Amazon right now, but it's an amazing, low sugar, really good tasting instant oatmeal, which almost anybody in our world you know, uses, uh, except the guys that say oatmeal is bad for you, bro. It's the got carno- gluten the in carnivore it. The carnivore people. Would well, that even have gluten? That's the funny thing. It's just, if it's, you know, has carbs in it, it's automatically. Right, dangerous. right. Carbs are, <laughs> carbs are evil, bro. Um, all right. Well, cool. So, um, like I said, I'll just start off by saying that like Hunter knows me probably better than anybody. Like he's been mentoring me under me and he's also been reading the exact same books that I read. And obviously I've taught him a lot of stuff and there's just very few people I would say that, you know, on the planet right now or the plane of third density that really understands like the things that I understand. And, uh, it's like I said, it's like an honor. Like sometimes I read some of the stuff he writes and I'm like, fuck, I can't write that. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, he's amazing. And, uh, I'm just, you know, really grateful that we're getting a chance to work together and do all these other things. So obviously today's podcast is about him. Um, so I, you know, let's just start, we're going to go a lot of different directions and, you know, that's obviously what the audience really cares about, but like, maybe just talk about your journey as an athlete. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Jay. It's an honor and we do a ton of stuff, but just to be on the podcast is amazing. So thank you. And thank you for everything you've taught me. So I'll go back and I just think, not to talk about myself, but just to give people a context. And I think people learn better through story. Um, so I grew up in North Carolina and all I ever cared about my whole life. And my mom will tell everyone this, like my first word was ball. All I cared about was sports. Like one play sports, especially football. That's all my, it was all consuming to me. My life, especially in high school was oriented around sports. I was so dedicated to football that I got good grades as insurance to make sure that I could go to college to play football in case I didn't get a scholarship somewhere. And if they would have it, that ended up being what happened. Um, I didn't get a scholarship anywhere. I was going to go to Davidson College, which is a little tiny college. I I, so I don't know if I ever told you this, but I think I did. But I played, I coached Bob McKillop's team camp. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, Steph Curry, he's kind of put Davidson on the map where yep. most people know him now. But um, I was going to go play football there, but their football is like very, especially back then, uh, there would have been like less people at the games than my high school games. So I was going to go there. And then found out that I got enough academic scholarship and financial aid to go to Wake Forest University. I was like, that's cool. So I'll go there and then talk to the coaches and walk on. They're like, yeah, sure. We'll take you to walk on because not a lot of people that are able to get into the school there are actually, you know, even interested in playing football. So 
Um, walked on there and then went through the journey of being a walk on, which I found out in the first year was like being a practice dummy. So you'd show <laughs> up and, you know, here I am, I'm thinking like, okay, I was really good in high school, you know, and all this stuff. And I get there and I was like, okay, you're a nobody. So you're basically just like holding the dummies and practice and kind of just like a practice player. Um, but I always, and I didn't know at the time, and we'll talk more about this later in the podcast and learning from, you know, someone like my mom who would always tell me like, write down your goals visualize your goals and all this stuff. And I remember like as a freshman, and this is kind of funny because looking back now, you would have looked at me and be like, you have no chance of ever playing football in the ACC. But I was just kind of happy to be there. But I knew like deep down inside that I had what it took. Even when nobody with the exception of my parents and family like told me, you know, obviously I didn't have any scholarship offers or coming, anything coming out of high school. Um, I would lay in my bed at night and like visualize myself as this player that was like way stronger, way bigger and way like just a leader and everything and like look at like have this image of myself like in games and like what I look like in my pads and stuff. And I would just like think that's going to be me. And I went through two and a half years and was pretty much like a practice player. And then heading into the spring of my red shirt sophomore year, uh, a couple guys got hurt during the spring practice. I think one guy got suspended or every or something like that. In the second game of the season, or maybe it might have been the third game of the season, uh, the starting linebacker went down and they didn't have anybody else to play in the game. So they're like, well, Hunter knows the game plan really better than the starters, but they just threw me in the game. And I went in and had like eight tackles in the second half. They're like, okay, at least he can play, you know, and like hang in there. Then the next week I ended up having like two fumble recoveries and had, you know, like eight or nine tackles. And they're like, okay, like he's legit. He's actually a good player. Yeah. And then I, I started the next game, which I think was at Clemson and we lost, but I did really well in that game. And then I got put on scholarship. So like, okay, Hunter's a good player. He's a starter on the defense. And then I started the rest of the year. Then our coaching staff got fired. So we didn't have a great year. We started off really good and then, you know, just kind of tanked the end of the year. Coaching staff got fired and we had a whole new staff come in. Now, luckily at this point, I was already on scholarship, so I couldn't, they weren't going to like take my scholarship away. Um, but they basically came in. They were like, we want our guys in. So the guys that are here, you guys suck. That's why we're here. You know, and the old staff isn't. So we're going to like do everything we can to like get guys out of the program or yeah. just like, yeah. So like, Back to like being second on the depth chart and everything, you go through a year as a starter and you think you've got, you know, everything there. So went through the offseason, ended up, you know, like becoming one of the best players on the team, starter and everything, and did really well with that staff and uh, have, you know, the utmost respect for them. Um, my defensive coordinator actually just got hired as the head coach at Texas A&M, just to give you an idea of like how kind of far ahead of the times they were. Um, but <clears throat> Worked out really well, so I was like two-time captain and all that stuff. Um, and like you said, had a little shot at the NFL. Didn't work out, but in the long run, I'm thankful, you know, as everything happens exactly as it's supposed to, that that didn't happen for me. But, yeah, as an athlete, it's one of those things. It becomes who you are, and I didn't realize it at the time. But everything that I do now in the world of business and all this stuff is really – it was developed in the fabric of being an athlete. Yeah. So, like, the, the athlete journey – as a child, especially up until the age of like 22, 23, when you finish playing college, it kind of like ingrains your DNA yeah. into who you are and like changes who you are. And I realized after I got out, I struggled. And this is where Jay comes into the picture. So, um, you know, I graduated college, tried to do the NFL, didn't work out, got a job at a bank, uh, ironically enough, in like near San Francisco in California. Um, did that very briefly. I was like, this is not for me because I majored in finance. You know, I just wanted to make money and I was good at finance. I was good at math and stuff. Um, and I was like, I hate this. So I just moved back home, moved in with my parents, got my real estate license and started selling real estate. Um, at the time that was really tough because when you're 23 and you're trying to like have your own business, you have no idea <laughs> what you're doing. And you're just, I'm just out there like trying to sell so, houses, just listening to the real estate coaches. Like, do you right. like tell you like, go knock on doors, go cold call or whatever. Um, and I struggled a lot during that time period and I was doing well, like I, like, you know, within the first six months was making money and stuff in real estate, but I just had this like idea of like what everything that I was done, you know, like I was like, man, I was in a stadium with a hundred thousand people yeah. and like starring in the show, you yeah. know, and was like doing well and was like, you know, getting your name called on TV and all this stuff. And now I'm out selling Darn. real estate. Yeah, I'm knocking on doors. Like this is a, this wasn't how it was supposed to work out. So I went through this phase, and this is kind of like on the you know like spiritual progress journey. Of like I felt like I was entitled to something, and I didn't even know what it was. But it was just like I'm like I deserve more than this because of what I've done, right? And you know now that I realize like you're never too good for something. You know you're never too good to like be the person that knocks on doors or whatever. 
Um, but as fate would have it, during that time, I listened to this real estate podcast that I think I found on YouTube or like in the podcast app. And uh, Jay would come on this podcast and they would start talking about health optimization stuff. That's Josh, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget the name of the podcast, but it was uh, Josh, the guy that Jay had a Josh supplement company. Yeah. yeah, supplement company with. And I listened to the ones with Jay and I'd be like, this is way cooler than real estate. And so I would just listen to those and because I was so into like health, fitness training and all that stuff. And so I, I've listened to those podcasts. And I'm like, man, I'm really picking this stuff up. And then I found out Jay had a podcast and started listening to his podcast and everything. And this was when I was 23, 24. Um, and I was like, this is the coolest thing. Because in that time, that was like when the biohacking space, yeah. as we know, like back then was like starting to blow up. And so like all these people had podcasts and everything. Um, and so when I would drive around for real estate showing houses or going to appointments or whatever, this is what I was listening yeah. to all the time. And um, it was funny. I was thinking earlier this week, like when I was like 24, like I used to think it would be so cool to like work in that space. I was like, man, like these people like are doing this and it's like not about making money, but just to be able to have a, like a career where you're helping people with health optimization. Um, Cause I was selling houses, you know? Uh, but anyway, like studied all of Jay's stuff from afar for a couple of years before I ever reached out to him. <clears throat> but um, during that time, I, I really struggled and you could probably call it like depression or something. It wasn't like depression. I think a lot of the way people think about it, it was just like a disconnect from, like my purpose in life and everything. And um, I didn't know what it was because I was like eating perfect, training perfect. Like I knew like, I, you know, Jay and I talk about all the time, like we don't have the story of like, hey, I was like really fat at one time. Right. You know, like I was a walk on, but like I was a very high level athlete my whole life. So like I'd always done those things. And I was like, what's wrong with me? Like I don't like I have low energy. I would get tired in the afternoon. So I'd be like exhausted, you know, like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, what's going on? I'm sleeping right. I'm eating right. I'm training right. And all these things. Um, and that's where I really like started doing like a deep dive into Jay's book about testosterone and testosterone optimization therapy. Um, so anyway, I, at that point I, I had reached out to Jay and we were just like, he was kind of like mentoring me from afar and stuff just back and forth. Um, but I went ahead and got my blood work done and everything. Uh, well, when I started working with Jay <laughs> or talking to him and I found out that I think, I think the first blood test, like I, 170 or 180. yeah, the first blood test I ever did to find my testosterone levels, the total was like 160. And on that blood test, the, uh, the free, if it's below five, it's just exist. doesn't show up. Yeah. And mine just said yeah. below five doesn't exist. Yeah. So like my free testosterone didn't exist. I was like, what is this like real? And so anyway, that's where I like, Jay was able to put me in touch with a doctor and I went on this journey. And as you know, when I think I was 26 or 27 that time, so when, yeah, when you're that age, doctors are very hesitant to ever put you on right. any sort of hormones or whatever. So you have to go through like almost a six month process of doing Clomid and doing HCG or whatever the protocol they, they have. Well, we'll for you is. About that. I think that there's a lot there to unpack because, you know, there's a lot of guys and then obviously the gals, there's value in this for you. So we'll get to that. But, uh, what happens is, and, and you can talk about this, and I want you to talk about this, but obviously we have a massive decline in testosterone worldwide values, you know, younger and younger men. We know why it is, right? Like men are watching porn, they're playing video games, they're not exercising, they're not going outside, they're not grounding. The environment's heavily contaminated. We know all these things, but also like guys like you, uh, you know, guys who play football, uh, you know, any any full contact sports, mixed, mar mixed it, martial it arts. It doesn't even have to be football. Like if you play anything where your brain is yes. getting rattled around, you know what's crazy about football? It's like I got hit in the head, like direct head to head contact a lot. But because I played linebacker and defense, and we started, I started playing when I was seven years old. There's like contact that is not head to head, yeah. but where your body is jarred, right. that your brain is still yeah. rattling around. Yeah. So soccer players have it really bad Absolutely. too because of like you know the stuff they do. Well, so. I think I think so. That's where I was going to go with this. Is I think that. In years past, we all, as athletes, dealt with these kind of things, but we also didn't have the massive decline and disruption of our hormonal axis. Yeah. So now when you combine like full contact sports, soccer, football, mixed martial arts, really, like you said, anything, even basketball, playing on hard surfaces, um, baseball, I mean, you could go on and on, soccer. It, 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 you're seeing more and more athletes having this issue than ever before. And again, it's, it's all caused it's multifactorial, it's environmental, but it's just, it's much more conducive now, again, because of the unstable environments and the endocrine disruption and all this stuff that you see a lot of athletes like this. And dude, as you know, 
it's not accepted still in professional sports or collegiate sports to use therapeutic testosterone, to use therapeutic peptides, to use any of these things. I mean, so all of these people sadly have to do this shit like underground or hidden, you know, or closeted to try to avoid drug tests and do it, whatever. I mean, we could go on and on and on. I mean, obviously I've talked about, you know, my bonus daughter, a lot of, uh, shout out to her. She's in the Division Two Final Four, which we're heading to North Carolina tomorrow. I don't know when this is going to run, so hopefully she's won the national championship by now in Division Two. But um, the reality is, is that un- they're underserved. The athletic community, from Division One sports to uh, professional sports, football, basketball, baseball, soccer. I mean, all of these people are literally having to hide. It's like medieval, dude. They're like yeah. having to hide in the bushes or in the closet to do things that, you know, the average person like me and you now who's not subject to that kind of scrutiny does every day. It's yeah. nuts. Yeah. And it's it's literally like f- what, you know, part of this too, and luckily like I got to the point in my life where I was like, I, I detached from the, uh, I guess I would call it sanctimonious nature that a lot of people have of, oh, I'm better than that because I exercise and diet right. I don't need to supplement with testosterone. And I knew, I probably knew, I knew at some point that I was going to do it. I just didn't know that I was going to do it that early. But when I started getting blood work done, that's when I realized, oh, something's really wrong here. And it's outside of my direct control in terms of what I'm dieting, how I'm, you know, training and all that. Well, we're brainwashed and you were brainwashed and I was brainwashed, but we're brainwashed in our 20s and our 30s to think that testosterone is for old men. Yeah. Or that, you know, a decline or a deficiency or any of that stuff is not for me because I'm too young. Yeah. And so nobody gets a blood work done. So obviously I like to think, you know, there's other people, but, you know, I was definitely one of the first champions to really go out there and push people to get their lab work done, to get, you know, independent lab work testing done. And, and this is nothing new. Like if I was a really, you know, smart, you know, internet growth hacker, I would have been talking about this 20 years ago because I remember when I first started using private MD labs, which I'm you know very open about, that was yeah. literally the same time I started using peptides. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, like, you know, I was using therapeutic testosterone since 2000, 19, literally the end of 1999, early 2000, but I was starting to get my own labs in 2004 or 2005 with, with private MD labs. And then I learned how to, you know, evaluate my own biomarkers and look for, you know, inefficiencies or, you know, discrepancies or, you know, lower values or higher values, all that stuff. So again, self-taught, but as you know, dude, and we're, you know, that's kind of the next point is really to, you know, once you become physically optimized, we can start talking about the spiritual path and the spiritual stuff that comes, the connection to what is, but it really does take you as an individual to do the work. Yeah. You can't read the books. You can't follow Andrew Huberman. You can't follow Joe Rogan. You know, you can't follow Peter Atia. You can't follow any of these people. And like, actually by reading their information and not to say their information isn't good because there's plenty of good information. And that's, if there's the biggest problem, it's the overabundance of information. Paralysis how, from right, information. How actually choose who to follow, who to uh, aspire to, you know, whose instructions to take seriously. It's just so much, uh, the signal to noise ratio, as you know, it's just insane. It's never been higher, but like the reality is, is you got to do the work, yeah. right? Like you can talk about the science, Again, you can have those people I just mentioned go out there and explain the science and break down phagodosia and break down this, you know, supplement or this supposed testosterone boost or any of these things. Who cares if you as an individual are not doing the work? If you're not actually going to the gym four or five days a week or three days a week and doing your cardio on days you don't go to the gym, eating right, you know, getting enough protein, training at positive muscle failure, all these things that are experiential. This is what is the inner work. It's not reading people's books. And again, I'm not putting down people to read. We read more than anybody. Yeah, read. we read more than you know, most people. It's reading the information and then applying the information to become aware, right? Like awareness, knowledge, true knowledge and true awareness is an application and experiential learning. It's not just reading books. And so that's where so many people today screw up because – They get confused in the knowledge, not the knowledge, but the intel. And then instead of doing anything, as you just said, they become paralyzed and then don't do anything. It's like, you know, I was just at Runga. I know we told you this, me and Monica did, but we were listening to this girl. And, you know, she's late 20s, early 30s, and she's just so confused sitting there in this panel. And there's a bunch of experts, including myself, sitting on a stage. And she's like, I just don't know where to start. And Monica just laughs because she's overweight. And Monica just laughs and turns around and she goes, how about you start exercising, right? But these kids, you know, and again, I don't want to pick on that generation of people, but they are confused because they literally have so much to choose from that they can't even take action because they're just yeah. stuck. Yeah. They're, which is funny because what's a symptom of low testosterone? Right. Apathy and indecisiveness. And so I tell that all the time. 
Uh, one thing I've kind of thought of now that I've been on this journey of hormone optimization, and everything is because for me, I was always kind of like a hard charger and hard, right. hard, like, you know, like go getter, but the amount of like decisiveness and assertiveness, but from a place of like, I know it's going to be okay. Whereas it wasn't like, like before it was like, I was driving cause I was anxious about like, I'm missing out on something or I'm doing right. this. Whereas now it's like, no, this is the way. I know it's going to be like, if, if it's going to be hard, that's okay. I'm going to put my next foot forward. But to that point too, it's like someone with low testosterone, unfortunately, a lot of younger kids now, they've never had optimized testosterone levels because of everything in the environment. They don't know what they don't know. Right. So they don't know what it feels like to have optimized testosterone. So they don't know they have a problem. Right. How's the only way to find that? I think, you know, for someone like that, probably to get their blood work done to actually right. compare themselves to say, oh, I do have an issue. But like a lot of people, like I don't have symptoms. I've talked to people that say I don't have symptoms of low testosterone. It's like, how do you, how do you know that? And they're like, well, I don't really, because they, they don't know the difference there. But I think that's to the point of like this, this whole realm is predicated on overwhelming you with stuff so that you don't actually make progress in your own life. And unfortunately, that's the downside of the internet is I think of knowledge and uh, kind of reading the book series, which I'm sure Jay and I will talk about that we've been reading recently. Yeah. Knowledge, information is half of the knowledge equation. Yeah. The other half is experience. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't actually have knowledge until you apply stuff. So we can read books all day and books are great. Jay and I read a lot of books. But until we go out into the world, until I create stuff, produce stuff, do anything, you know, I'm not going to have half of that knowledge set. So imagine everything you've done and like stored in your head in your whole life. That's only half of what's actually out there because you still have to experience the rest. <laughs> to that point, like you see all these, and again, I'm not picking on younger people, but this is where I see it mostly with the internet marketing hustle is like, you know, you see young people talk about like these amazing locations around the world and they write about it, you know, and they're like, Oh, you know, this is like, I, you know, I want to make movies about it or I want to like do this or that or whatever. And it's like, motherfucker, have you ever even been there? Yeah. And most of them will say, no, I've never been there. I'm like, well, then how could you write about something? Well, you know, I've researched it. I, I've read all these other people who've written about it. I've, you know, I've read firsthand accounts of other people. But as you know, none of that is ever going to equate with you actually personally, firsthand experiencing what it is. Because it's exactly what you said. Like the application of being there in person, of feeling the energy, of sensing the energy, of even leaving your energetic footprint there cannot be replaced. It cannot be duplicated. It cannot be imitated. So it's like that's when you really have to like really start taking people serious because like – People that are quote unquote so called gurus or experts that you find online, like if they haven't actually been there or actually quote unquote done, set, just call it the work of actually applying themselves in the energy field of like where it is, whatever it is that they're talking about or researching or doing it, then they're they're missing as you just said fifty percent of the battle. Yeah, well, and I think too that when um, you have people that do that, it takes away. We were just at the gym earlier. And we were talking about how many people actually know how to train to failure. And you can watch all the YouTube videos. You can design the workout plans. You can do all that stuff. But when you go in the, into the gym and you're under a leg press or a whatever machine and you're on the 15th, 16th rep and your mind is having to push through that rep and push through that rep and push through that rep, you can't replicate that. Only you can figure that out. Only you can push through that threshold. So I think you can apply that to every area of your life, whether you're building a business, whether it's trying to progress spiritually, whether it's trying to do any of those things, like no one else can do that for you. And I think a lot of times, especially what we see with people working with a lot of people on the internet is they want to kind of outsource that yeah. to like here, take, take the gorilla off. Of that, you know? Yeah. Like how do I like do this and kind of hack this and do it? I mean, biohacking, you know, like how do I hack this? And a lot of that is actually like forcing yourself to go through certain things. And then when you do that, you actually like gain this whole new set of knowledge that you can go and apply and teach other people and everything. And, you know, we work with so many people. It's like, we can tell people exactly what to do, but they're not going to respond to it the same way someone else is. And then they're going to get a whole new uh, insight into their life. You know, we talk a lot about peptides. We're the peptide people. So it's like, we tell people how to use peptides, but I can't tell you that you're going to respond to a certain peptide that someone else. Well, like another example, of what you're it. saying is, and we just found this today, is that AI tool that literally takes experts, which now they include me in this group, and just 
regurgitates and copies and mimics. So if you go on this tool and you can share it, maybe. It's, I think it's called Dexa.ai. Dexa, D-E-X-A, -E like Dexa body scan for fat loss, a Dexa.ai. You literally can go in there and you can put in a search tool and put like Jay Campbell view on peptides or Jay Campbell's view on fasting or Jay Campbell's view on testosterone. And it literally comes and you know scans and, and, and pans the internet and literally takes everything that I've ever said, most likely, or you know, has been regurgitated. And that's the thing. And that's where we yeah. go with this. Um, and, and just gives it to you right there. But then, you know, Hunter was like saying to me as we were looking at this, because both of us, our jaws were on the floor. We're like, dude, like there's what no... is it? Yeah, what do they not have us out for, like in terms of our communication? Well, there's, I mean, I mean where this goes is there's no creative thought anymore, right? Because yeah. what's happening is smart people who have placed creative content, and we're gonna get into creation, but like online it's now hacked mimicked duplicated gimmicked it's it, it, it's it's compressed it's you know uh leveraged i mean there's so many adjectives and verbs that you can use on like what they're doing with people's creative content it's insane so it's like the, the truth is though to get back to what you're saying about training because i really want to i think that's a great article to, or topic to, to 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 go really granular on Chris Geffen and I, when I was together with him two weeks ago, shout out to Chris. His podcast was just on a couple of weeks ago. He's an amazing guy. And uh, I can tell you guys that next year in 2024, we're going to be doing a uh, big retreat together. He and uh, a couple other people, I, I won't mention other names until they commit. It's going to be in Mexico. It's going to be at the end of 2024. So be on the lookout for that. It's going to be amazing. Hunter will be there, of course, too. But uh, it's it's really crazy to watch people, as Hunter said, in gyms across the world training because again as hunter said the best way to say it is they don't let's just put it this way they don't train at an intensity level necessary to create adaptation in their body so you see the same people day after day week after week month after month year over year you know the ones that keep showing up and they never look different now if your job and just call it your your goal of, of going to the gym is to augment your physique to look better naked to be more muscular, to be leaner, to whatever, then how are you ever going to do that if you don't, as you just said, train at an intensity level necessary to uh, create adaptation? And, you know, Chris Gaffin's great line is, they're just warming up. You know, his, his whales, British accent, yeah. they're just warming up, Jay. They're just, they're just <laughs> warming up. That's what he says. And it's literally true. Like, the average person that goes to the gym and trains, and I don't care what the program is. I don't care if you're doing three to five, four to six, eight to ten reps, and you're doing, you know, six sets per body part, you know, 30 sets a workout, you know, times two, right? Cause you're turning two body parts. I mean, most people overtrain from a volume standpoint, because again, as you said, they don't ever, they don't ever train an intensity that maximizes or gets the positive muscle failure. So they always have room in the tank. Yeah. They can keep doing set after set, rep after rep, rep after rep, because they're not doing anything productive, but it's true. The average person has never trained at an intensity level that we train at. They do not train to positive muscle failure. And because they don't, as you said, they never learn what the threshold is of where they can take their body because they never push themselves. And I don't like to use the word pain because we don't use no pain, no gain. That's retarded. But there is a certain uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's yeah. uncomfortable to <laughs> yeah. go at a certain level of your training where you actually get to pause the muscle failure. But as you know, and you're a lot younger than I am. I mean, you're literally 21 years, 22 years younger than me. So, I mean, the reality is, is like, once you get there, it's simple because now your body understands the threshold of like, oh, okay, I can get to here, you know, and that's why, you know, and again, this is not like some sales pitch on this podcast for the training program that we employ, but like when you train in higher rep ranges, whether it's 15 to 20 or 20 to 25 or even 25 to 30, you're taxing all these different energy systems and the energy systems when they're regularly taxed, allow you as a trainee. And again, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, this is, applies to everybody. It allows you to train in an uncomfortable level regularly. And so you can get to finally, again, it's a psychological component where you can push yourself past that level of like, maybe I can't do it. Because if you always train at five, six, eight, 10, 12 reps, and you're doing all these sets, you and your mind already have a cognitive dissonance that training at 20 rep ranges is for pussies. Yeah, or it's too light. that's lightweight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so like, so you don't understand what it really takes to train at an intensity level. And look, I'll be the first one to admit it. I never trained at the intensity level to build an amazing world-class physique until I was close to 40 years old. And, you know, I always give him credit, you know, Jim Brown taught me this and, you know, 
he didn't teach me on energy levels. I learned that about myself through myself and my own research, but he always was like, look, dude, high reps is the way to go. And I'd be like, and Jim was a, is a beast. He still is. He's a very gigantic guy. We don't talk anymore. He's a good dude, but like he was, he, he knew how to build muscle. And he's also a very, very smart, very brilliant guy. And, you know, he taught me that. And so as I started learning and applying that, and then I taught you and I've taught obviously hundreds of people now, probably thousands at this point, your body changes. I mean, yeah. I mean, again, you're 31 and you were already strong and you could train at, you know, pretty awesome volume because of your athletic background and stuff. But like, you know, today him and I were training legs and he was doing sumo squats and he's way stronger than him now. I mean, like his legs are twice the size of my legs. And, you know, obviously at my age at 53 now, I'm not putting any kind of compression on my back or my lower, or, or excuse me, my lower back when I train legs and I'm just training now to get a pump and to, you know, keep, keep size. And I have decent size, but like his legs are huge, but like, how much stronger have you gotten since I, you started training at higher rep range? Well, it's way stronger and it's not stronger in the sense of like, and I'm not saying this to brag, but like when I played football, I squatted like, I almost got, yeah, I got to 585. I never made 600 because I was like the number 45 on the bar. But the point being is that like, yeah, I could move that much weight, but the way I can control and contract muscle fibers now is vastly, vastly different. And I would argue, it would, I would not argue it is. From an aesthetic standpoint, I'm much more developed, much leaner. And in terms of like my body fat to strength size, I'd also say one thing too is like the lactic acid threshold that I have now to be able to push past that is way, way higher. And I played football. You would say like someone that plays football is pretty like pretty high metabolic, like lactic acid threshold they can push through. When you do this, it pushes you through that. Now, what I've also noticed too that I didn't realize before and this kind of goes into like the interplay of physical and spiritual yeah. is the neural networks that get created when right. you do that sure. translate into other areas of your life. Yeah. So like we've, like I've always said, people come to Jay to learn how to get ripped. And then, you know, within, after they get ripped, then they realize it's about the spiritual journey. Right. And the reason, and I know this may sound weird, but the reason that it's so important to train properly, fast, diet, all the things that we te you know, teach and talk about is because it trains your mind in a way that unlocks neural patterns to where now you take that same ability to where you push your body to failure. And when you go to work the next day, when you are interacting with you know, like an argument with someone, you have a problem with your spouse or something comes up in your family or something like that, you now are building in patterns into your mind that you understand, like yep. I'm in control, yep. you know, and that doesn't happen overnight, but when you start to do that, it does translate and trickle down to where like the physical baseline yep. is the base of the pyramid. And once you optimize that all of a sudden, like the emotional gets better, the mental gets better. And then eventually the spiritual. Well, gets to better. that point, cause let's, let's just go there now. Like to that point, like when you can push your body physiologically past a level of just getting in, call it discomfort, and you do it regularly day after day, you know, three or four days a week. And then let's, you know, you could obviously, you know, liken that also to your cardiovascular activity and stuff like that too. But let's just focus on the weight training. You are in, like you just said, you're so in control of your emotional body, right? Because we obviously have, we have the mind, we have the intellect, we have the energy body, we have the subtle bodies, which is the etheric. But like when you have total mastery of your physical body, you're not going to hold patterns of trauma like, forgiveness or anger or you know lack of gratitude or any of these stupid things that so many people hold on to hunter day after day after day when something bad again they label it bad but when something happens to them that they don't like they hold it against them you know it could be their husband their wife their girlfriend their brother their sister whatever and they just hold on to these trauma patterns and obviously as these trauma patterns are held on to and never released and never forgiven they create disease right and disease is obviously a part of inflammation from the you know, spiritual you know amputation or trauma that eventually causes the degradation of the cells and the cells then become disease right whatever it is but at the end of the day it's totally true like when you have physical mastery from your training now obviously there's parts and part and parcel of like eating correctly and sleeping and all that stuff but mm -hmm. when you have that it's just so much easier to be in control of your energy field yeah. right because you're not going to and, and look for you guys that know me that you know, long term and stuff like that. I was not, I was not always like this. Like I was a maniac until I was probably 40 or 41 because I didn't work on my inner game. I didn't work on my spirituality. I was working on my physique, but I've said the story many times before, you know, when Monica first met me, she was much more spiritually advanced than I was. Um, but she would say to me, she's like, well, what do you do for your inner game? And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. Like, what are you talking about? Right. And she's like, well, you know, you have this amazing physical body, but that's just your shell. Like, what about what's going on inside? 
So I never really understood that you had to work on your inner game. But like once I started to do that, mm -hmm. the combination of mastery of the physical body, which I really much pretty much already had. I mean, you're always learning, always growing, always adapting. But like once I was able to combine the two and again, it took work, right? Again, yeah. you're, you're, you're pursuing spiritual development. You're pursuing greater awareness, greater knowledge, uh, you know, control of the etheric body through meditation, introspection, contemplation, sitting in nature. Once you start adding that to your repertoire, which again, an athlete like you and I were both, you know, ex athletes, we already had the physical mastery and that we knew we had to exercise. We knew we had to get good sleep. We knew we had to wake up at a certain time and to compete and do all these things. But then once you combine that inner work, you know, the con con contemplative work with the understanding of the physical everything really starts to get line bro and that, again it goes back to managing your energy field when something bad happens to me now i very rarely freak out there's times i'll get really mad if i feel like somebody has like really bothered me like obviously the thing that happened earlier today you know it really bothered me so i talked about it but i don't like react yeah you know what well I mean? and and the thing the about control. that too not to like go into detail of it wasn't even about you it was about right. other people and like right. wanting to protect them so right. And that's the thing, right? So are you in, you know, and again, we say this in our calls on Tuesday nights, but like, are you so in control of your energy field that you you choose to respond out of love, which as you know, takes time. Yeah. It, it, it takes contemplation, reflection. You have to think about it versus what most people do, which is totally react out of fear. And when you react out of fear, you go ballistic. You're totally, your ego is cashing the check. The ego is in charge. You're screaming. You're carrying on. You're being a baby. You're probably complaining, blah, blah, blah. And look, we've all been there, bro. I mean, yeah. every single one of us has been there. But when you have, again, this control of your physical body and you get this control of your physical body by pushing yourself into what we call positive muscle failure day after day or, you know, week after week, you just, it's so much easier to get into that spiritual alignment, to talk about the spiritual things because you just have control over it. And you're right, dude, we take it for granted because- how many people don't have control over it? And when we see people that don't, we just, you know, usually you're just going to be like, oh, sheeple yeah. or, you know, just a normie or whatever, you know, whatever we call them and stuff like that. But again, anybody who's willing to do the work, both the inner work and obviously the external work, which is, of course, working on your body, your physical body, working on your physicality can get these levels or can achieve yeah. these levels. Anyway. So I'll say something and this may be triggering to a little bit of people and you won't see this if you're listening to audio. But on this chart here, I would argue, dude, that it is almost impossible to get like 200, 250 if you are fat, inflamed, and diseased. Probably, probably. Because what happens is like this is actually like a calibration of your etheric physical body. Yes. And so what's happening is like when you're inflamed and sick, you're in so much pain in your physical vehicle that you actually can't contemplate being in service to other people. Right. There's, It's not physically in that respect to your physical being right. possible because you're so caught up in how bad you feel, no sleep, no energy levels. It's no pure survival. Exactly. You're in survival mode. So there's no way you could possibly serve other people. But then once it's funny because like how many men and women, they spend their whole lives taking care of their kids, taking care of their business and whatever they trash their body. And then all of a sudden they wake up one day, they either have cancer or they have something wrong where it's like, they can't, take care of those people anymore. And it's because they never took care of themselves. of themselves. And we see it because we worked with, you know, thousands of people now and coached all these people that they get like so caught up in doing that. And like, I've got to give, you know, all those things, but they never took time out for themselves. And one of the most selfless things you can do is manage your energy field because you're not going to be able to serve other people. So I'm not saying that to judge or anything, but if you're in a place where you're not healthy, you're not going to be the highest realized version of yourself from an energetic standpoint, right. because you are not managing your energy you feel properly. The good thing about that is we're all here right now in this incarnation, this realm, whatever it is that we're doing to learn that. So whether you're a hundred pounds overweight or you're, you know, 5% body fat, the fact that you're here right now experiencing this means that you are on the journey and you're here to learn. And I don't think anybody would vibrationally be listening to this podcast. If they weren't somewhat aware of that and somewhat called vibrationally into that. So I would say like wherever you're at on your journey, understand that it's like we're all and Jay and I too, like we're all learning how to manage our energy fields. And that's through our own self management. And then how we what we've learned this year is interacting with other people and being able to decipher and discern how you interact with other people who you decide, decide to spend time with and who you allow into your energy field, because that's a very sacred thing that you have to protect. Beautiful man. So there's two two last talking points, and this is kind of like Hunter Hunter and I's jam now. And you know, we'll just say it right now. But like, I don't know what's going to come out. I don't want to like jinx it, but we are working on 
which I will definitely consider my magnum opus. It's going to be his first book, but it's going to be called Essential Alchemy. Essential Alchemy. So yes, Ascension, the woo-woo Ascension. But like what to do as an aware being in this plane, this third density experience to get out of here, right? And that, so that's what it's going to be. So we're going to have a summary of like where humanity stands, you know, what has been going on for millions probably, if not billions of years in this third density realm. Uh, and then we're obviously it'll direct after we give you guys a summary analysis of what's going on. We're going to give you guys what we would like to think is really good advice, direction, and ultimately solutions on breaking out of here. Because look, there's only one reason we're here, all of us. It's not to be ripped, right, or to be shredded or to use peptides or therapeutic hormones or lift heavy or, you know, be strong or, you know, any of those things. Those are all part and parcel of the physical body vessel, which, as you know, bro, is not even real, right? Like the physical avatar body is what we consent to invent in the third density experience to evolve and grow our souls, right? Because at base essence, all we are is spiritual beings. And as a spiritual being, your job is to progress, right? Like, again, I always say the great Walter Russell, you know, said that the job starts or the beginning starts when you come out of your mom's womb and you're at the base of the jungle and the journey is back to the top of the mountain, right? So it's like, if we're looking at this chart, it's ascending, so you go from shame, which is 20 on the, on the vibrational scale, which is humiliation and miserable, all the way up to enlightenment, pure consciousness, what is, right? And that's at like 700 to 1,000. And there's probably, you know, if we calibrate it, there's probably higher quantifications above that, right? Like in pure enlightenment. Most likely outside energy. of this density. So yeah. this would be like the third density. Yeah, exactly. So this is like living or, or experiencing third density. And, 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 and let me not confuse any of you guys. You can't be in the 500, 540 fields for more than a couple of seconds. I always tell people, like, if you truly want to experience unconditional love the easiest way possible, if you have a domesticated animal, usually a dog, some people have a cat, and you go away for the day and you come home and your cat or your dog is running up to you, wagging its tail, so happy to see you, so excited to be with you, that is unconditional love. That is a vibrational field of somewhere between 500 and 540 on the level of consciousness. And so if you want to embrace that, you can hug your animal and embrace that energy that he or she is giving off to you. And then you're going to be at unconditional love. Now, again, as a human in the third density experience, you can't maintain that energy field. You can take drugs. You know, there's drugs out there, uh, hallucinogens, 5MD, 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 5MDMA, there's you know, 5-MEO, there's there's all sorts of different, uh, you know, chemical agents and formulations that can move a human energy field into a certain level of experience, but it's not maintainable. As we always say, you know, in the bio biochemistry and uh, molecular alterization space, what comes up must go down, right? So it's like, you got to understand that you can't maintain a certain energy field, especially a vibration of like love, right? Like the goal as a human being living on this planet, highly aware is to maintain an energy field of like 250 to 400 and, and, and bounce around here at most times. And, you know, in good days, get into the low 400s and even into the low 500s again, when you're in like that field of, of love. Right. And I would say if you're in a loving relationship with a person, you know, and you have amazing, passionate, inspirational, loving sex, not just fucking, but sex, you know, actual lovemaking, you can probably stay in the low, I mean, in the high 400s, low 500s at times too. But the point is, is, as we already said, like your, your goal as a soul is to evolve. Okay. And to grow and to eventually get the ability to exit the third density experience. And Hunter and I have been reading these books and we're going to talk about them real quick here. Um, and we talk about these, by the way, almost every Tuesday night at our show living in resonance in our uh, private membership group, which is fully optimized health, which I can put that up here for one second. I think $99 a month, two forty nine a quarter, uh, Hunter and I do all of our work in there. If you ask us questions by email now, we don't even respond. You got to send, you got to be a member of that group. It's almost 360 people now. I think it is 360 people, men and women, very advanced people, biohackers, spiritual gurus, influencers, internet marketers, everybody's in that group. So if you want to be in that group and really expand consciously, like everybody else is there, please join it. But this group, or excuse me, this book series that Hunter and I have been reading in the last four months now, it's crazy, dude, it's four months, is the Wave series by Laura Knight Jadizic. And Laura is an amazing human who's now actually conversing with me and Hunter. She lives in France. 
And she wrote this amazing eight book series. What, bro? Starting in the nineties? I think she published it in the early two thousands, right? Yeah, a lot of the work is on the nineties. Yeah, so she was on like an 2000s. internet forum, and they were posting all of this information. But she finally published these books, and again, it's eight books. They're very, very deep. Hunter's on book eight. I've read all the eight books, but uh, by far the most profound stuff that we've ever read, and we've read voraciously. Okay, about what's going on: esoteric consciousness, conspiracy. Uh, mankind's ancient ancestry, all this stuff we've read and we, you know, we're pretty deep into it. And her compendium of eight books, and she's written others, is just, it's profound. And our goal is to summarize what we've read, which is not going to be an easy task, as you know, because it's so, so diverse. We're talking like so thousands deep. and thousands of pages that we've read. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable <laughs> how knowledgeable this person is or how knowledgeable she is. And also her husband, Arkadeus Ark. He's a Polish uh, quantum physicist, but it's just unreal, the information. And so what we're intending to do or attempting to do, uh, and hopefully in 2024, uh, is summarize her work, come up with our own uh, master thesis based on like a lot of the stuff that she's come up with and she's hacked through uh, and along with the people that she quote unquote speaks to in the future, uh, come up with our own working, again, just call it synopsis or scenario of what's going on here. And then the second and third and final part of the book will just be giving us giving our strategies of like what we know and how to get out of the third density. But like, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So in the last few years, Jay and I, and a lot of the guests he's had on this podcast, especially to talk about like the nature of what's going on in the world, we've referred a lot to the bifurcation of the species, right? Like everyone's like either becoming one of two places and I don't even need to go into it. If you're listening to this, you probably know what we're talking about. Um, but I think after reading these books, what's actually happening is a bifurcating of reality. And hang with me here if you, this is like sounding a little off. So people like Jay and I, and most likely if you're listening to this podcast, a lot of times you go out in the public and you see people and they see the world completely differently than you. They don't understand the same things. They don't see the same things. They have a negative outlook on life. And then you see people like us or other people that you know that would listen to stuff like this. And they really are the creators of their reality. So they see a bright future not because of the nature of the realm that we're in, but because of what they can create. And without getting too long-winded, more or less like the nature of the reality we live in, with oversimplifying it, would be like the movie The Matrix. And this is talked a lot about in these books, but it goes into very, very, very granular detail about the actual uh, structure, mechanisms, and functioning of the realm that we live in. I think, you know, well, I know the book that we're going to be writing – I, I want to give an analogy. So like Jay and I are athletes in order to have played the games that we played at a high level, we had to have a very deep understanding of the rules. So as a football player, I had to know what was a penalty. I couldn't grab a person's face mask. I couldn't hit someone when they're out of bounds. Understanding the rules really helped me become a better football player and understanding techniques of how to do this, how to do this, how to navigate. And as I got the experience, as I became a better football player, by the time I was done, you know, like 17 years into playing football, I was really good. And I understood, I understood how to move my body. The nature of the realm that we live in is much like an animal farm or a matrix or call it whatever it is. Charles Fort, what is he saying? Somebody's, uh, this is a farm. Or no, what, yeah, that's what he said. It's a farm yeah. or somebody's property. Exactly. And I don't say that to be negative, but if you understand the energy dynamics and you understand the nature of densities, most of humanity is enslaved. I don't think it would, you don't have to be into like the stuff that we're into to understand that there is an agenda to subjugate and enslave humanity. But dude, let's break this down because I'm glad you brought this up because you're smarter than me and I wouldn't have even brought this up. But we're going to create a chart in our book that will explain this to you guys in the best way possible because it's, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around this. But imagine understanding that there are seven densities. Now, not dimensions and densities are different. So don't get confused that there's like seven dimensions because that's not true. There's seven densities, but there's multiple dimensions. There's mo You guys are familiar with the multiverse, right, from Marvel, right? So the multiverse posits that there's multiple timelines, there's multiple infinite realities, there's multiple permutations of human beings, or, or just call it living beings, in different timelines and different realities at different times and, or, or different space times. So there's only those seven densities. So first density is animal, mineral, rocks, right? Plants. Second density is the animals. Probably certain forms of uh, vegetative life that are higher than plants. 
Third density is humans. Okay. Fourth density, this is where it really will blow your mind, is variable physicality. So you've got like all sorts. And by the way, when I say humans, we're talking about this planet, right? We're talking about Earth, whatever Earth is, a realm, a planet, a density, whatever it is. But the bottom line is there are other beings or other species or other, you know, call them ETs, sentient and non-sentient beings. But that's what third density is. And then fourth density, you are basically multi-physical or you can be an energy body or you can be a physical body, right? We always talk about how these physical bodies are imagined for soul evolution and growth and third density. Well, in fourth, in fourth density, you're both. And you're think about energy. it to simplify that. Think yeah. about water. Water can be water vapor. Yeah. It can be frozen uh, ice. Exactly. It can be ice. So it's just in that. Think of a being that could do the same thing that water. Does. Right. So then fifth density is a way station. It's literally where souls go after they expire in a physical avatar body, right? And it's not just Earth. It's, you know, again, multiple different planes of, of, of awareness or, you know, planetoids or spheres or whatever you want to call them. But so that's where the souls go, like, again, after physical body death. And then sixth density is purely energy. Although from what we understand, it can also be because you're so high advanced from an energetic standpoint that you can also create matter or you can create anything. You can basically shape shift. You can appear, again, variable density. And then seventh density is source. That's like, perfection, enlightenment, you know, angelic beings, pure energy beings. There's no bad or good. There's just what it is. And that's like, obviously, uh, service to others, very advanced consciousness, uh, love. It's like probably pure love, right? So that's kind of the way you have to understand it. So like when what he was saying is like, when you quantify a human in third density, there's three densities higher than this. So that means that we are basically a dog on a leash to beings in fourth density and sixth density. It's that simple. So okay. you have to understand that. You have to get a mind that makes you realize as a humanoid being an upright walk by you know, bipedal hominid, two two feet, whatever, two legs, that you're not at the top of the food chain. And you never were. Right. And can you deal with that? Right. Because I mean, obviously in science, they teach us that humans are the top of the food chain, right? Like we're at the top of the evolutionary tree. We're smarter than dogs. And we're Richard than Dawkins, birds. the selfish gene, right? It's like humans. Yeah. I mean, right. it's, they're all so <laughs> retarded. It's, it's so broken from an understanding. And so the best way to explain this is you either have a third density view, you're 3D. Like when we say, to, you know, Hunter and I say, oh, that person's so 3D, or you have a multi dimensional view. So what I'm explaining is a multi-dimensional viewpoint of existence, not a third density or third dimension experience, 3D, right? Which is what he was just saying, like, you know, the, the atheists talk about, like, we're at the top of the gene pool, the God gene, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, dude, like, we're not. And, like, if you think that, you just are unaware. You are locked into a third density slash third dimension state of expression and experience because you don't see the big picture. Well, and within these densities, and this is what the a lot of the book is going to be able, be about, every being has free will. Mm -hmm. So that may sound intimidating or like, oh, you know, like what's the point then, Jay, if there's six densities and we're just like food on the food chain, right? For the reptilians. <laughs> Here's the beauty of it. We all have free will. Those beings can't interfere with your free will. Now, if we can think about these two densities, in the third density, there's two different dichotomies that you could exist within. There's service to others and service to self. So you can be in service to self, meaning you, you cheat, you lie, you steal, you try to get ahead, you try to squish people down in order to achieve things. And that might not even be from a malevolent standpoint, you just may be in that. So we've all been in that point in our lives when we're just thinking about money, I've got to make money, I'm trying to make money. Or you could be in service to others, meaning that you're, atta you're not attached to the work that you do because it is part of creation. So this podcast right here, no one's writing me and Jay a check for this podcast, but through the act of creating it and helping in our intent, you know, before like every day when we set our intent is to create and love and serve others. And so the intent of this podcast is not to try to sell you anything. If you end up buying stuff from us, great. But the intent is to serve you in whatever way it is. And I'm not attached to the outcome. If that means I've got to go be a garbage man in my free time, so be it. Because I'm not attached because my heart is aligned with creation and with creating things and not trying to uh, basically like coerce or convert people into my thing. You can think about this like a lot from like a sales perspective. How many salespeople try to like convert you and they've got to like hook you and they've got to use neuro-linguistic programming to try to convince you of something. 
the best salespeople in the world never sell anything because they just teach you about something and they help you make a decision when you're ready to make that decision yourself. So if you're existing in the service to self paradigm, as the old axiom goes, live by the door, live by the sword, die by the sword. So if you're treating other people like that, if you're treating animals like that, if you're treating the earth like that, you're trying to exploit the earth, you know, because that, that's a density too. like the, you know, earth is a living being. That's a density too. If you're living an exploitative life, guess what? You're on the food chain. So somebody is going to exploit you. However, if you, through your conscious intent and free will, choose to live in the service to others paradigm, you actually now connect with source, you connect with creation. And I'm not telling you it's always going to be easy, but you're going to align yourself in a reality that that will begin to reflect back to you. So think about that, like, you know, and that's like the real like hit home of these books is that is like blown Jay and I's mind is like every little thing can relate back to one of the, those two paradigms. That's genius, bro. Well said. Um, <laughs> Well, so to, to understand service to self and service to others, by being in third density, we chose to be service to self. So every single one of us, when we descended in consciousness to incarnate in a third density physical body, we are automatically in service to self because we're in survival to even survive, right? Like if you were in energy. It's the nature being, of the realm. Right. Like if you were that, in, yeah. an energy being, you wouldn't have to be in service to self because you don't have to feed yourself. You know, you don't have to do all these things that a physical body being has to do, right? So- as Hunter said, if you are in a physical body and you already by nature chose service to self, because as he said, it's a service to self realm of third density, um, you can become what they call in the books a service to others candidate. Mm -hmm. And being a service to others candidate is living the life that we talk about, that we preach of, you know, raised vibration, a raised frequency, treating people with kindness, concern, care, uh, love, uh, peace. And I'll just say it very simply like, if you're a service to others candidate, you cannot kill other life forms. You cannot go out and hunt and shoot and kill the game animals. Now, again, there's various qualifications here. Like if you were starving to death and living in a third density physical body, you had no food. It was either that or you were going to die. You could probably make an argument that, you know, I'm doing that because I have to eat. I need an energy source or my physical body won't keep going. But if you're walking around, as he said, destroying the environment, polluting, killing bugs, Killing bugs, throwing trash on the side of the road, killing like bugs, blows, yeah. throwing trash on the road, doing all these things where you're violating conscious being, sentient being, free will. That's the other thing is like you have to understand that everything is sentient, everything is conscious. Everything the bugs, the insects, the mosquitoes that bite you, the flies, the spiders, they're all conscious, they're all sentient. So if you're out there killing them left and right and they're not violating your space, they're not doing anything. I'm not saying that. We all haven't killed spiders or bugs that are biting us or ants that are biting our feet or whatever and stuff like that, right? But if they're not violating you and you're out there with your free will consciously choosing to kill them, that is not anything but service to self. It's just what it is. Now, again, I'm not saying that we all haven't done that because we all have done that. But like if you get to a place where you realize and you value all life forms, you're not going to be running around polluting. You're not going to be running around killing spiders or insects or flies i mean look you got to get to a point consciously where when you can rescue an, an insect and put it into the wild you do that you don't just indiscriminately wantonly step on bugs you don't step on cockroaches i know this sounds crazy to some of you guys because you're like oh come on you know you step on cockroaches, right but it's like you can't willingly violate another sentient being or organisms free will by killing them when they have no intent or effort or effort intention to kill you or do even harm you. So these are the kind of things that you have to raise your frequency to where you respect all forms of life. I mean, it's like I said, when I came back from Peru and I had Lake Titicaca come alive, you know, in, in the way we experienced it and kissed me and then we all spontaneously cried. It was at that point in my life for the first time that I knew that everything was conscious and everything was sentient. The wind, the rocks, the trees, the animals, the, the birds, the bees, the insects, everything. And it was that, at that point I developed this insane, again, really newfound respect for all life. And I, was, and I knew I was never going to violate life. And, you know, I'll be honest, I'll tell you guys this right now. That's why I can't kill other beings, right? Like, again, if it was an act of self-defense to defend my family or a loved one or something like that, and they had an intention of killing me, then I probably could. But I don't indiscriminately wantonly do it. Like I'm not going out hunting and killing other beings indiscriminately like a lot of people do. Right. So it's like I'm not judging people to do that. I have a lot of friends that are hunters and I love them and that's cool and that's what they do. But like you have to realize that that on a frequency of consciousness scale is not behooving you. 
to advance and get out of the third density. And let's just finish with that, right? Like, so the last talking point is knowledge protects and the importance of creation. And, and again, this is all from the book. And I'm going to let Hunter talk about this because I know he's going to do an amazing job of summarizing this. But the reality is your goal, besides evolving and growing as a soul, is to attain wisdom, to attain knowledge that's not just from reading books, as we've already talked about, but experiential. So you gain the wisdom and then you put it into an application. You apply it by going and doing it, right? You do the work, right? So knowledge is ultimately what's going to protect you at a set a soul or slash energetic level and will also gain you give you the golden key or the magic ticket to get out of third density into fourth density yeah well to that point knowledge like jay said we are here to evolve learn and grow our souls so knowledge protects now what does that mean we were actually watching this movie last night and there was a very masonic literally masonic thing in there where they had like people on a chessboard i think it was killers of the flower moon or something like that but um, anyway, the point was that Jay and I were saying, like, you understand the symbology, you understand the manipulation that's going on through something like that. Now, if we didn't have the knowledge set to understand that, not that movie specifically, but we would be very easily manipulated into believing certain things. Why is that important? Because if you get manipulated into believing certain things, you now become service to self, you become, you know, on the food chain and whatever, and you, you know, you fall victim to someone else's agenda that you like can become a part of. When we look at knowledge, like we were saying earlier, half of knowledge is just getting the information, the other half is experience. Now, the first half of that, the knowledge is acquiring information so that as you go out and experience, your guards are up. And I'm not telling you to be offensive to people, but what I'm saying is. When you understand the nature of the realm and you acquire the knowledge, and that could be reading books, it could be, you know, whatever it is, listening to podcasts like this, you now have a duty and responsibility to understand basically that you can't unsee the nature of the realm anymore. So it's kind of like, for lack of a better analogy, like taking the red pill of the matrix. When you open your heart and open your mind to understand and say, hey, I'm willing to accept understanding that will come to me that defines the nature of my reality. I now have a responsibility to behave accordingly as I go and perform the rest of the duties and everything in my life. Why is that important? Because as things come into your consciousness field, you will now have the skill set and the tools. How many times we talk about it's like having the tools to manage your energy field for protection from energy vectors or other things that will try to throw you off the path. If this really is like a simulation of a video game or whatever it is, I think it's much more complex than that. (laughs) But there's always villains. There's always little like side stories and stuff that are going to come and try to distract you from the mission, which is reaching the end goal, which is kind of transcending this density. And are we going to do that in these physical bodies? No, but our soul will. And our soul lives, you know, we are not these physical bodies. Our soul lives on longer. If I can acquire the knowledge while I'm here to guard myself against that and add that into my soul, it's going to protect me from those things that distract me and keep me away from that mission. So knowledge protects literally in the sense that it keeps us away from the physical and the ethereal things that come up in our lives that will pull us away from the mission, which as we all know is to evolve, grow our soul and transcend, like Jade said, become an SEO candidate, transcend this density and move on. And to kind of close out with that, like Jay was saying, I think a lot of, and we're not going to go in on religion on this podcast. If you want to come to the group, we will do that in plenty, but <laughs> Uh, I think a lot of the great avatars, you know, call it like the Christ or whoever that came and all these other great avatars that came, we're trying to teach this and got co-opted through religion. And unfortunately, people that are well-meaning get detracted by that and distracted by that because they don't allow themselves to acquire the knowledge because they get so fixated on that this way is the right way. And they don't open their heart to say like, okay, now I'm not saying you get like, like convinced by every single person and join a bunch of cults. What I am saying is that you learn and then you develop discernment and then you now have your own knowledge that protects against all those things. And it's unfortunate that just as politics or, you know, entertainment or whatever does those things, religion does the same thing. And I'm not saying that, you know, this is obviously like a spiritual conversation we're having, but um, you need to have that knowledge to protect you because as things come into your life, you're going to have to have discernment. And it's just part of the hero's journey. So beautiful, man. Amazing. So you guys, always support the amazing people that come on uh whether it's in person or via remote video the jay campbell podcast support hunters amazing oatmeal company which is zero oats.com he's also available on amazon i know right now you're out of stock right yeah it should be like when, whenever this airs it should be like late january january early february once we get everything so hopefully this will air actually before the conference 
going to. So by the time that this airs, you guys will be able to buy it. And then uh, go to uh, Instagram, IG, and also his YouTube account. He's got amazing stuff on YouTube, uh, Hunter Williams Coaching. So again, youtube.com forward slash Hunter Williams Coaching, and then follow him on Instagram. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon. See ya.